Good morning. You'll uh, notice in your bulletin, I'm not sure what to say about it, but it's the grinning something or other in there. Ethan, back there, yellow. It's a wonderful Sunday whenever we have communion. It is also a wonderful Sunday whenever we have baptism. And today we're celebrating uh, as a church with Ethan uh, the baptism upon confession of his faith. If you uh, want to know more about him other than just what is briefly written there, you can seek him out and find him, introduce yourself to him, talk to him, and uh, find out what God has been doing in his life and where he's at. Uh, you'll notice there, we, uh, you'll notice here, we don't have any place to uh, baptize, so we go to one of the diamond pits northeast of Steinbach on Clear Spring Road. So if you don't exactly know where that is, just uh, get in behind somebody who is going, who does know where they're going, and just follow them. Uh, or you can uh, find that wonderful map uh, on the back and decipher that as you will. Uh, please turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, since we do baptism once a year, um, it's, it's actually been a couple of years since I have uh, spoken on baptism, uh, so I thought this, this time around we would take a little, uh, little look at uh, baptism and, and what it means. A couple of years ago I preached on Colossians 2, uh, we've preached on Romans, and so we're going to go to uh, one of the other uh, main passages about baptism in the Scriptures in the New Testament in 1 Peter chapter 3. So let's read together. Uh, from verses 18 till the end of that chapter. 1 Peter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, this morning for the opportunity to participate together uh, with Ethan as he uh, follows your commands to pursue baptism. We thank you for the confession of his faith and for what that means for for him as he moves forward. I pray that today would be a very encouraging day for him and for us as a church, as we who have been baptized remember its significance, its meaning, uh, its encouragement, and its hope. Lord, as we uh, get into these verses just briefly this morning, I pray that you would uh, illumine them, that your Holy Spirit would use them to help us to understand uh, what baptism means, to which it points, and to that that we need to address within our lives. We pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. For those of us uh, who have been in the church, you know, for any length of time, uh, baptism is uh, something that we're quite familiar with, and uh, when you think about it, it seems like something that is pretty simple, you know, it's something that we do, relatively speaking, all the time. I mean, we do it uh, in our church uh, once a year, so relatively speaking, all the time. Uh, What happens is, you know, uh, we... I and somebody else who wants to be baptized, we walk into some water, uh, I ask them uh, four questions about their confession of faith, and then as a minister of the gospel and representative of both Christ and the church, I immerse that person, dunk them in the water, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Baptism over, we all walk out and go our own way. I think we all know that baptism is important. We all know that it's commanded by Christ, it's to be done uh, to confessing believers, it's to be done in and by the church as part of the discipleship uh, that we engage in as God's people. 
And I also think that, I hope, I'll say it that way, uh, by this point, that since I've preached on baptism from Colossians 2, and have preached several sermons from Romans 6, that we all understand uh, what baptism signifies from those pas- passages. Uh, upon confession of faith in Christ, uh, the person seeking baptism enters the waters, and, and they do so because the waters are symbol- symbolizing the death and the resurrection that we are united with Christ in. The bad, very bad grammar. So what happens in the, the waters of baptism, the symbolism is very simple. When the person goes into the water, it's symbolizing their death to sin. When they come up out of the water, it symbolizes their resurrection with Christ to new life. And we recognize that the act of baptism doesn't really do anything. It's on account of Christ's sacrifice that the trip into the water symbolizes that we actually have the benefits that the sign points to. So when we think about baptism, our usual thought, and it's right, is of repentance and faith. Getting rid of the sin, coming up out of the water in faith. Uh, But that is not the whole picture of baptism in Scripture as 1 Peter 3 shows to us. The passage we have today is is a significant additional perspective. It doesn't change anything about what I've just described, but it adds a few very significant elements to the meaning of baptism and why it is important for each one of us to remember our baptism, or if we have not been baptized, to pursue it. And it also adds a very practical encouragement to our faith. You see, in Scripture, baptism isn't something where you just sort of do it and move on. And and it's just, it's something that happened in the past you never think about. In the Scriptures, baptism is very significant because it's something that, as Christians, you can hold on to. It's symbolic for your faith. And so as you remember what baptism is and what it represents, you can look back to your own baptism and say, that is the sign and the seal of what Christ has done for me. And therefore, these realities are practically true for me. And so what this passage here, in in somewhat of a difficult way, reminds us about is that our baptism signifies not only our union with Christ in His death and resurrection, but it also signifies our union with Christ in his suffering, which led to his death and resurrection, and his future exaltation. In that regard, it's encouragement for each one of us. It's encouragement for each one of us in the trials of life. Let me explain sort of where this passage comes in the book of Peter. As you know, I like to preach expositionally, start in chapter 1, verse 1, and end whenever the book ends. So I feel very uncomfortable jumping in the middle of the book because I feel like I need at least, oh, I don't know, 12 to 15 sermons to set the context, but we'll try and do it just in a little bit. Here's what's important for us to recognize about the occasion, the the people to whom Peter is writing. He's he's writing to a group of persecuted Christians uh, in Asia Minor. Uh, These people have experienced uh, quite significant persecutions, cast from their homes, uh, released from their livelihoods, and now they find themselves to be, using Peter's words, aliens in their own country. Uh, Peter reminds them that even though they're aliens in their own countries, they're persecuted, they're cast out, uh, they are in fact Christian sojourners. They are elect exiles. They are a chosen race. They are a royal priesthood. Chapter 2, verse 9. The, the first uh, you know, nine or ten verses of chapter 2 are very important because Peter recognizes that his readers, that the people who are going to read this letter, are facing very difficult times, and they don't have a home. They don't have a, a place that they can call their own. And so Peter wants to remind them that you know what, you're dealing with difficult times, you're going through a, a, a time of homelessness and persecution, but, but don't see it as being a displaced people. See it as being sojourners, just going through this life. 
And each one of these trials is getting you to the goal that God has for you. So endure your trials patiently. Endure them because God is going to one day deliver you from them. And so Peter reminds them of several very, very important things by the terminology that he uses in chapter 2, verse 9. He reminds them that even though you don't have a home, no place to sort of hang your hat, you're set apart by God. You're holy. You're sanctified. You've been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. You are heirs to a glorious heavenly inheritance that God is leading you to. And so this sort of pain and suffering and trial and difficulty that you're going through in this life, that is actually getting you to the next life, to a better life. And Peter says you have to go through this in order to get to that. So keep the promises of God before your eyes. See, what, what I like about the authors of, of the New Testament, the authors of Scripture, is that there, there are some occasions when the author says, listen, I want you to look back on the cross. I want you to look back on what Jesus did in the, in the cross, in the empty tomb, and the victory over sin. But in times of suffering and trial and difficulty, authors like Peter will, will take a different tack. They'll look, they'll look forward. They'll say, listen, things are difficult and, and they're terrible and they're suffering and there's trials, but know this, that this is leading you somewhere. Because of that, you're going somewhere, and in the meantime, you're going to have to deal with trials and sufferings, which makes sense because this isn't your home. This isn't where you belong. You're an alien. You're a stranger. You're just, you're just passing through. You should feel uncomfortable in this world because there's nothing in this world that should appeal to you. And so the, the, Peter says to them, listen, endure these times of trials. They're the pattern of Christian life, and just remember... Just remember, in the life of Jesus, the, the crown of thorns preceded the cross. The empty tomb and the glorious life come only after suffering. And so essentially our author is saying, if it was true for Jesus, it's going to be true for you. Now in the, various, in, in the previous section, the immediate section, just before this, verse 8 to verse 17, Peter instructs Christians as to how they're supposed to treat people who are actively cursing and reviling and persecuting them. He says, listen, I don't want you to return in kind what they give you. When they curse you, when they revile you, when they speak evil against you, what I want you to do, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, is I want you to give the reason for the hope that lies within you. So when they come at you, I want you to say, oh, no, no, wait a minute. Let me, def let me show you the reason why I believe what I do in the face of your opposition. Give them a word of blessing where they give you a word of curse. And they're supposed to do this, verse 17, because it's better to suffer for doing good. It's better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than to suffer for doing evil. God hears the prayers of his oppressed people and he promises that he will deliver us from those who have wronged us. Now, he might not deliver us in this life. Our deliverance might wait until our, our death and his second coming, but the deliverance is coming. But how do we know this, right? Like, what, what do we have to hold on to? Like, it, it's, it's something, uh, it's, picture it this way. You know, we talk about, in a cliche form, the light at the end of the tunnel, right? Well, the reason why we say the light at the end of the tunnel is that the light provides hope. If you just say, hey, look in the tunnel and it's all dark, there's no hope there. It's like, well, how long does this flipping tunnel go, right? Look at the light at the end of the tunnel and follow that. There's your hope. There's your exit. And so what Peter is saying is, listen, you can hold on to the light at the end of the tunnel, which is your future with Jesus Christ. And Peter says, listen, I, I want you to look in the past for an example of what God did, and then I want you to look into the present for what for something that is an antitype of that so that you can then look into the future. So he, he goes back and he looks at Noah. And he says, look at what God did for Noah because that's what God did for Christ and that what is what he's going to do for all of you who've been united with Christ. 
And he says all of that is represented in the waters of baptism. The Christian is never going to be free from present suffering and persecution. But since we're united to Christ in his death and resurrection, we're also united with Christ in his ascension to the the right hand of the Father. And for us, what that means is the same thing that it meant for Jesus. Deliverance from judgment. One day. The light at the end of the tunnel is that one day we will be delivered from all these trials, all these difficulties, knowing full well that we will not be judged for our sins and we will instead enjoy the future blessings that God has given to us in Christ. Now, we have to recognize, and I'm going to sort of skirt around this. Uh, you know, I, I, was, I was debating whether I should preach this passage because there's a lot of weird stuff in these verses. And then I decided I sent Iris my outline. You know, it kind of like when I do that, I sort of feel committed. And then I read Martin Luther. This is what he says. A wonderful text is this, and a more obscure passage perhaps than any other in the New Testament, so that I do not for a certainty know just what Peter means. And I was like, oh, great. So does that mean I don't preach this passage? Well, no, I sent the outline to Iris. She can be mean if I... So here's what we're going to do. We've got a baptism to get to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what I usually don't do and skirt around all the difficult stuff, focus on all the easy stuff so that we can get the general idea of what Peter is saying about baptism. How's that? And then at some point, maybe in the future, we'll pe- preach through the book of First Peter and we'll spend like three or four sermons on this passage and get into the difficult stuff. So here's what, here's what this passage and, Paul, and Peter's perspective on baptism is. Where, does it, where it takes us. There's, there's three things about Christ that, that focus our attention on the meaning of baptism in this text. The first is that we need to recognize the foundation of our faith, of baptism. The reason why we baptize at all is because of the substitutionary work of Christ. Verses 18, 19, and 20. Christ our substitute. Uh, we notice at the beginning of this verse 18, the word for which we know already links this passage back to what has already preceded it. So we know that what is coming is connected to the theme from verses 18 through 17. And we are told there that we are, to, that we are called to suffer for doing good. Peter told us that in verse 17 is that it, it probably is going to be God's will for most of us to suffer for being good. And, and it's better to do good and suffer for that than to do evil and suffer for doing evil. And in that regard, we're told that we should do it because Christ also suffered. So if the master can suffer, then the servant should expect to suffer as well. And in that regard, Christ is our great example in suffering. The servant is not greater than his master. Christ suffered, he took up his cross, and those who follow him must also do the same. Pick up our cross and walk the path of suffering as we follow him. But Peter is saying so much more than simply, Jesus suffered and so will you. He's saying much more than Jesus gives us sort of a practical example of how to handle suffering. So when we're suffering, we look at the way Jesus handled it, and then we have this sort of practical lesson. What he's saying, notice in verse 18, is that he suffered once for sins. There's a uniqueness to the suffering of Christ. There's a purposeful character to the suffering of Christ that cannot be said of any of our sufferings. And that's why the example of Jesus only takes us so far, because what Jesus was suffering for was for the salvation of all those whom the Father had given to him. We simply suffer because of our own sinfulness, our own uh, time in our finite world, and our own doing of good in a fallen world. And so the death of Jesus has a very unique character. It's a, it's a once-for-all sacrifice for sin. No other sacrifice is needed. Not any religious sacrifice we think we may offer God. No sacrifice of worship that we can offer to God. There's no amount of money we can give to the church 
in order to sacrifice enough for our sins. There's no sacrificial work of philanthropy that's enough or social justice that is enough or, or anything like that. There's no sacrifice as it relates to our own goodness, no any words or works that our hands can perform that will ever be enough. There's only one thing that is enough to overcome sin, and that is Christ's sacrifice of himself once for all. That is the only sufficient sacrifice that meets our need before the judgment of the Father. And notice how this works. Peter says it's a once-for-all sacrifice, the righteous for the unrighteous. The righteous for the unrighteous. That is to say... Jesus is the righteous one who offers himself in our place. We are the unrighteous in order that we may come to God and be reconciled to God. Our wickedness and our sin are are put away, replaced by the righteousness of God. We do not bring any righteousness into this transaction. God the Father receives Jesus Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. His, the punishment of our sin falls on Jesus Christ. And because of that, we are now reconciled to the Father. A great exchange happens. A, a double imputation, if we want to use theological terminology. Our sin is imputed to Christ when he pays the price. And then his righteousness gained is then imputed to us, which we then accept by faith. So he is treated as though he were guilty, and we are treated as though we were righteous. Not our righteousness, but his righteousness. Again, the image of Luther is is very important here. As we remember, Luther talks about the cloak of Christ's righteousness being draped upon us. So that when God sees us, he sees Christ's righteousness on us, even though on, on this side of our death and, or his second coming, we are both sinner and sanctified. We are, we are righteous because of what Christ has done, but we are sinner because we continue to be sin. In short, the aim of Christ, verse 18 tells us, was to overcome the alienation and judgment brought about by our sin, and to bring us to God in reconciliation. The work is all His. All His. There's nothing for you or I to do. No words, no works, no priests, no sacrifice, no standard to meet, no law to obey, no words to pray, no ritual to perform. Nothing. Nothing you need to do. Christ has done it all. He's our substitute. And you and I can have no hope, no hope for any future, no hope for any salvation unless it rests in Jesus Christ alone. And that's why faith alone gets you that salvation. He can do what you and I never can. He pays a price that you and I can never afford. And so he is our substitute. And we access that by faith alone, in Christ alone. And it's the acceptance of this reality that is the prerequisite for baptism. Uh, just as Paul says, Colossians chapter 2, 11 to 12, another sort of, well, it is a, a clear passage on baptism. Paul writes this, In him, in Christ, also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh, By the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Faith is the only way to access that substitute. Faith faith in Jesus Christ is the only reason to pursue baptism. And so what Peter is emphasizing to us is the necessity of recognizing the substitutionary work of Christ as the foundation for our faith. Now, when we get to verses 19 to 20, they are, you know, pretty obviously difficult verses. So I'm going to leave 
the long exegetical journey we would need to take to get at them and just offer my conclusion regarding them and how they feed into the next verse. So verses 19 and 20 feed into verse 21. So, so we have to deal with this because Peter says to us at the, at the beginning of verse 21, he says, baptism corresponds to this. Well, the this refers to what he's just talking about. So we have to understand what the this is in verses 19 and 20. So I'm just going to give you a little brief sort of, not even a rundown. I'm just going to tell you what it says, and then we're going to, then we're going to move on. Uh, I think Meredith Klein is correct when he concludes that what Peter is saying in these verses is that Noah performed prophetic preaching as the mouth of the Spirit of Christ when he was building the ark and he, when he was preaching while he was building the ark. So verse 19 is this whole idea of he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly da 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 I think what he's saying there is that Jesus was preaching through Noah at the time, through the Spirit, to those people. That's verse 19. Then in verse 20, Peter remarks that a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So at some point in the future, I hope that I can sit down at the Starbucks in heaven and talk to Peter and say, why did you write verse 19? Why couldn't you have just gone straight to verse 20? Just go straight to verse 20. You could have saved all this whatever. But the verse 20 is really the point that Peter wants to make. Okay? The, the point he's trying to make connects us back to verse 18. I hope you can follow me. The very same element which God used to bring judgment upon the world is the element through which God saves this seemingly insignificant family. That's Noah and his wife, their three sons, and their wives. So that's an important point for what Peter is, is saying. It's an important part of what, of what the, the death and resurrection of Christ is and what it represents, is that the element of judgment is also part of the salvation. So by placing his people in the ark... Peter is saying, God brings them safely through the threatened judgment which now wipes out the world. So Noah and his family had to go through trial and trouble and difficulty and suffering. They had to build the ark. They had to deal with the persecution. Then they had to get in the ark and they had to bob around on the, on the water for a whole bunch of days with a bunch of animals and whatever. And they had to do that in order to get through the other side. And so that is the point that Peter is really trying to make. He says, what I want you to understand is that there's something about that act that God performed with Noah that is, rep that is a, a type that points us to Christ and then points us to the significance of baptism. Now, let's turn to verse 21. Hopefully, that will make sense. So, verse 21, we come into Christ our rescuer, Christ our rescuer. So let's kind of expand this, this bringing in of Noah so that we can understand baptism a little bit better. Noah and his family believed and obeyed. They had faith in God. He built the ark and then they went into the ark. And then, as verse 20 says, a, a, a probably a more literal reading would put it, they were saved through water. Right, So our, our translation is my SV says they were brought safely through water. It's a good translation. More literally, it would be they were saved through water. Saved through water. And that sort of triggers a connection for Peter back to the experience of the believers in the churches to which he was writing. Back to our experience as Christians as we deal with difficult things in our life. And so to illustrate his larger point about God's ability to deliver his people from difficulty, trial, trouble, disaster, whatever, Peter turns to the account of Noah. Noah was delivered from a, a catastrophic judgment, a, a, a flood which God brought against the unbelieving inhabitants of the earth. They were 
horrible people. As we remember that passage, God looks and says, there's, there's unbelievable evil on this, on this earth and I need to deal with it. And not only that, but they were persecuting the righteous. They were persecuting Noah and his family. And God told Noah within that to obey his commandment. Build the ark. Don't return the evil that he suffered from those laughing at him, cursing him, and reviling him. Instead, do what is good. Right? There's your connection to verse 17. What we have from Noah is he didn't, he didn't respond in kind to the persecutors. What he did was he did what was good. Well, what was good? Obey God. He obeyed God. He, he shut out everything that everybody was doing, and he built this ark. God saved believing Noah and his family from the dire circumstances by a flood, a historical event which Peter now connects to Christian baptism. Just as God delivered Noah and his family through the waters of judgment, so too God saves Christians through the waters of baptism. Okay, Peter's wording here is very deliberate, very forceful, and we have to be careful that in, in trying to say what Peter is not saying that we don't understand what Peter is saying. He's very clear. Baptism now saves you. Baptism now saves you. Now, what does he mean by that? Is he, is he contradicting what he just said in verse 18? Because in verse 18, he says that Christ suffered once for all, once for sins, and, and then he suffered the righteous for the unrighteous that he will bring us to God. And so we've already established that faith in Jesus Christ is a prerequisite for baptism. So is Peter now saying, oh, dang it, baptism too. Faith and oh, you've got to pursue baptism. There's just that one little sort of addendum, that one little footnote that you have faith, but now you've got to get baptized. Well, no, not at all. And, and the reason why we know that is because of his example of Noah, which he just talked about. The experience of Noah and his family in the flood is a type of which Peter's audience and their baptism is the antitype. So, I don't want to get into typology, but basically the idea is Peter, when Peter thinks about what, what believers are doing in their baptism, he thinks about what Noah did when he believed in God, God in the ark. That's what he's thinking about. And what he's, what he's thinking specifically about is that in order for baptism to be what baptism is supposed to be for you from a divine perspective, you have to believe the promises of God. You have to have faith in God. You have to believe in what God has done in Jesus Christ. If you don't, then the waters of baptism are meaningless to you. They offer you no encouragement. They, they offer you nothing. Everything that God promises to you in Jesus Christ is not represented in the waters. And so for Noah, he had to climb inside to escape the flood. And, and for us, we have to climb inside the water in order to escape the judgment. That's what Peter is saying. He is saying, if we want to use fancy Latin terminology... Baptism does not work ex opere operato. It doesn't work simply because you're getting wet. Right? That's a Catholic belief. That if you just experience baptism, it's, if, it's effectual. Because God will make the change in you and your faith is largely irrelevant. It's more, I'll add this one to your list of Latin terminologies, it's more like this. Ex opere operantis. Which is by the work... I know as soon as I say work, you're always getting, you know, getting uptight by the work of the doer. And what is meant by that is that faith is the prerequisite of baptism's efficacy. See, one of the mistakes that we make, uh, because well, I'm going to make an assumption, because we come out of this sort of Anabaptist, we're tainted by Anabaptism, let's just say it that way. And where we think of, oh, baptism is, is a, you know, it's, it's an outward sign of an inward faith. And, and we think of the Lord's Supper as just something that we do. It's an, out, it's an outward sign. But that's not what Scripture says. Scripture says that this is a means of grace. That when we accept 
the cup and the bread by faith. Uh, you know, to borrow from Calvin, he says, I have no idea what happens. I have no idea how it happens. But what I do know is that it is an integral part of the building of our faith, our sanctification, our encouragement to future and present Christ-like living to take the bread and the cup. There's a spiritual benefit from it that wouldn't come to you if you didn't do it. And then he says, but just understand that if you just do it, you're not getting any benefit. Don't think that if you just do it, you get a benefit. That's what the Catholics say. But if you do it by faith, recognizing, reflecting on what God has done in Jesus Christ, there's something that happens. And the same thing works in baptism, right? See, if, if, the, if a person receiving baptism doesn't have the prerequisite of faith, doesn't understand verse 18, the substitutionary work of Christ on their behalf, doesn't understand that, that baptism symbolizes the, the, their, their repentance and their faith, the, the, the death to sin and the rising with Christ. If they don't recognize all of that, it's just a waste of everybody's time. We're just going and walking into freezing cold water for no reason. So the only sense in which baptism saves, says Peter, is that it is the occasion for, as he says in that verse, an appeal to God for a good conscience. That's, I think, Peter's way of saying faith. Faith. Baptism saves you because it is representative of the faith that you have. So think about it, think about it this way, right? We're given the example of Noah. So think about it this way. If Noah had built the ark... Picture this, okay? Noah finished the ark. He's, uh, I don't know how long it took him. Uh, it took him a long time, and, and he built the ark, and, and the whole time he's just got his neighbors and his family, and his, probably his mother-in-law, just in, in his ear, right? Just like, why are you building that ark? You're wasting time. You should be doing this, right? And then at the end of it, he goes, you know what? Look at that. I built an ark. Looks up the clouds. There's no rain anywhere. That was useless. What a waste of time, right? And then didn't go in it. What good would the ark do? Nothing, right? He he would have had the same fate as everybody else. The ark would have done him no good. So like that, without faith in Jesus, there is no possibility of salvation. Without faith in the promise of God, there is no deliverance for Noah from the judgment to come. You've got to believe the promise to get into the ark. You've got to believe the rain will come. The flood will come. And this is my only way of escape. If I don't get into the ark, I will not be saved. So how does baptism save us? It saves us the same way the ark saved Noah. You've got to believe. You've got to believe. You've got to have faith. You've got to believe that there is an ark of safety into which we may flee to be rescued from the flood of judgment that is coming. And so in that sense, the ark is Jesus Christ for us. Baptism is a picture then. It's a proclamation of the way of escape, which is to be found only in the once for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now, we've all witnessed baptisms before, as I mentioned, and we're going to, if you haven't seen one yet, just, hey, have I got a treat for you, all right? You're going to get another one. And we all, if we've been baptized, we all have our own baptisms. I hope that you remember how many years or decades ago they may have been. And what Peter wants us to understand is that your baptism is still preaching to you the good news about Jesus Christ. Your baptism is to be something that you can actually look at and say, there are the promises of God given to me. We can say the same thing about our baptism that we say about the Lord's Supper. We say, think about this. Hold the bread in your hand. Reflect on the broken body of Jesus Christ. We, we do the same thing with the cup. The blood shed for you. Think about what that means for you. Right? Weep over what God has done for you. Celebrate the salvation that is yours. And what Peter is essentially doing is he's saying the same thing about baptism. Think about baptism and what it represents for you. 
don't hold on to it as though it's your salvation, but think about what it means as a sign and symbol of what God has done for you and be encouraged by that. It's good news that continues to preach to you. And it does more than that. It calls you. It calls every one of us to remember our confession of faith, that, we, that we've died to sin, and we need to continue to repent of our sin, and we need to continue to embrace the coming up out of the water by faith and believe in the gospel. So then, if we put Paul from Romans 6 in Colossians 2 together with Peter here, we end up with a, a full picture of baptism, what it means and why it's important. Baptism is the visible sign of what Jesus gives us through faith in his promise, through the power of Holy Spirit. So too, Christians who are baptized are properly said to be saved from the wrath to come by the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. Baptism saves us then in the sense that those who are baptized have the external sign and seal that they will be saved from death and the grave and God's future judgment on account of the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. Like Noah, those who believe the promises of God trust that they will be saved from the judgment to come. Those who persecute them will not defeat them, even as God saved Noah from the waters of the flood. Essentially, what Peter is doing is he's saying, listen, you talk, you know, we talk a lot about the death and the resurrection of Christ. And we should. But the other thing we need to remember is that he ascended to the right hand of the Father. He ascended. He is preparing that place. And so we don't understand the fullness of the meaning of the gospel for our lives unless we recognize that the death was preceded by the suffering. And the resurrection is followed by the ascension. And it's all of that stuff that is represented in the waters of baptism. And so we recognize that Jesus is the ark of safety for us. In order to be saved, we, we must get into him. He is the way of escape. He is the only rescuer that is given to us. There is a There's a flood coming, to borrow the language from the story of Noah. The flood of judgment is still to come. We know that. We know that God's wrath, right? We were just in Romans, is being poured out even now. And we know that that is just just but a foretaste of the fullness of God's judgment, which is to come in the future. But those of us who have gone into Jesus Christ by faith will be rescued from that judgment. When we stand before the great throne of judgment and our sin is recalled, our life is recalled, Jesus will take all of that on us. He is going to be our rescuer when the accuser tries to make one last pitch for our souls. He is the ark of our safety. He is our substitute, believed in by repentance and faith. Then in verse 22, we get this final push, this final promise, just very briefly given to the baptized. The same Jesus who was raised to life has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. Angels, authorities, and powers are subjected to him. And again, we have to remember this. Jesus has not only conquered death, not only conquered sin, he is now at the right hand of the the Father and all powers, human powers, Angels, even death itself, are subject to him. And God has promised this to us in his word. And we ratify that promise when we enter the waters of baptism. When we get baptized, we are saying, yes, Lord, I I recognize what your death and resurrection mean, but I also recognize the victory that you have given me over sin and that one day you will give me in perfection in the future. And so baptism is not only a confession of what God has done for us in the past. It doesn't just look to, a, look to something that has happened historically, but it's a confession of what he's doing for us in the present, right? We are, in, if I can say it this way, we are riding in the ark at the moment. 
right? We're in the ark as we're passing through in this life, right? Remember the terminology Peter used, sojourners, exiles, strangers in a foreign land. We're in the ark, and one day, one day when the waters of God's judgment are done, they are finished, what he's going to do is he's going he's to beach our ark, and he's going to open up the door, and we're going to walk out into the perfection of heaven. And we will enjoy the beatific vision for the rest of eternity, and we will enjoy the full victory of Christ over all the powers that could possibly oppose him for all of eternity. So Peter does something very interesting here. See, many of our, I don't know how, how, I, don't know how I say it, a lot of really bad Christianity teaches us that in times of trial, we're supposed to really believe, really believe, right? If your faith is strong enough, you'll go through your trial. It's, it's a subjective thing, right? It's like when trials and difficulties and tribulations come, it means your faith isn't strong enough. And if you just have more faith and more belief and more love or more whatever, then your trials are going to go away. But Peter does something completely different. He instructs us to look away from ourselves, look outside ourselves. Don't, don't rely on your feelings. Don't look at your circumstances. Look instead to the promises which God swore to us on His sovereign oath that are represented in the waters of baptism. See, God's promises never depend on our human feelings or our emotions. See, isn't it wonderful that Scripture never says, faith that is strong enough alone. It just says faith alone. Faith alone. And I think you know as well as I do that sometimes our faith, ah, it's just hanging on by a thread. And you know what Christ says? It's not the kind of faith, the strength of faith, it's who the faith is in that matters. And sometimes that faith is just going to be that little string that you're just swinging from. But it's in Christ, and so it's as sure as you can get. And other time, that faith is going to feel like a harness, and you're just bolted in, and you're never going anywhere. But again, it's not your faith. It's who your faith is in. It's in the concrete historical events that have, been, that have happened already when God sent His Son to die and rise again and ascend to the right hand of the Father. And it's in historical events that will eventually come. They, they will be a part of human history when they happen, where God is going to keep His promise to deliver us no matter what our circumstances are going to be. And so Peter encourages his readers to persevere, and he reminds them of what their baptism means as, as a way of encouraging them. By being baptized, a person recognizes, hey, I'm marked out by God. I am one of the chosen few, like Noah and his family. I'm going to be saved, even when all the rest of the people around me are going to, are going to mock me for my faith. They're going to slander me for my faith. They're going to revile me. They're going to persecute me. They're going to, they're going to put me down. I know that I have the surety of belief because I am in the ark of Jesus Christ. And so baptism is the symbol of, their, uh, of each one of us being united with Christ in His resurrection. And it is a reminder of what His death and resurrection means for all things who oppose God. Baptism is significant because it reminds us of the victory in which we currently stand. The victory that Christ achieved by His death and resurrection and exaltation above all principalities and powers. And so, like the Lord's Supper, our baptism doesn't, it, it, our vision doesn't stop there, right? We, we don't look at our baptism and say, I, you know, hey, I can be encouraged in the present because I, I've been baptized. We say, no, I, I'm encouraged in the present because my baptism symbolizes something that God has promised me. And in that sign that I have accepted by faith, I am given to God the pro I'm given by God the promises 
of my future delivery. And so then we need to ask ourselves, do I trust Jesus Christ, the King, to overrule, to reign in every situation, in every suffering, in every success for my good and His glory? If the answer to that is yes, well, Peter says, get baptized so you can hold on to that, so you can see it as something that points you to Christ, and then press on, press on. You're going to suffer. You're going to speak for God, and people are going to revile you. You're going to live for God, and you're going to live for His glory, and and they're going to treat you as though you're an idiot. You're going to risk everything for God, and people are going to wonder, why are you doing that? And yet your baptism recognizes that there is no risk in serving God believing and proclaiming God because He is protecting you. He reigns. The victory is already won and we could not be any more secure than we already are. When you run to Christ, which baptism signifies, you run into the ark of safety. Jesus Christ is our substitute and when we accept Him by faith, we receive the fullness of salvation. But He's also our rescuer. When we come to Jesus Christ by faith, we go into Him, the only ark of safety from all the difficulty and trouble and trials and future judgment that is going to come. And Christ is our victor. He has already won a victory over everything that is going to contradict us, everything that's going to come against us, and so we can have confidence in Him. And so if that's your confession, if that is what you believe, then, then Peter says, you got to get baptized because it is a wonderful sign for you to hold on to when the whole world is coming against you. And all of that is what we celebrate today with Ethan. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this difficult passage and for the reminder that you have substituted Jesus Christ for us so that we can be saved, that you have provided him as our rescue, that he has become the ark of safety for us. Lord, I pray that each one who has come to you by faith would truly see this picture, this wonderful picture of Jesus Christ as our safety. No matter how difficult times are, no matter how troubling our world seems, no matter how difficult our circumstances might be, you are protecting us. You are bringing us to a future without any of this difficulty. And Lord, we praise you for the victory that you have won over everything that we consider to be opposing us in this life. Physical frailty, our our difficult circumstances, persecution, and ultimately sin and death itself. And Lord, for those who have not yet believed in this wonderful gospel, I pray that they would come to you by faith today. And for those who have not yet pursued baptism, I pray that their faith in you and that would lead them to this obedience and this encouragement and this challenging step so that they can look to their baptism in times of trouble to see what you have done for them. Lord, I thank you that Ethan has moved in this direction today. I pray that you would continue to bless him, challenge him in his faith, encourage him as he goes through this step and beyond. For your glory, amen.